Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us again. Uh, today, we will talk about Argentina at the crossroads, perils of dollarization, with Ivan Werning from MIT and his co authors, Thomas Cavallo and Pedro Martinez Pereira. Hi, Ivan. Good to have you with us. Hello, Marcus. Thanks for having me. And we're looking forward to learn what, given the election outcome on Sunday, and uh, we learn more what's going on in Argentina and you know what the policy implications might cause uh, for Argentina and the neighboring states. Starting with a few remarks, uh, Argentina, of course, has shown us that there's a tight link between fiscal deficits and inflation. So inflation recently was around 140 percent. There's some large hidden government budget deficits and large deficits more generally. And on Sunday, there were the presidential elections where there was a choice between, you know, some Venezuelization, some people argued leading potentially to hyperinflation and a hard liberalism. So it's, uh, it was a tough choice in both ways. And we tried to learn more what the election outcome might imply for the Argentinian people. So first I would like to start just to give a brief overview of uh, currency regimes. So of course the big debate and the candidate was or one the elections is proposing to introduce some dollarization, so some full dollarization like what we have in Panama or Ecuador, not only an informal dollarization where informally the dollar is accepted as a currency, it would be officially accepted as the legal tender in, in Argentina. That's different from a currency board, where a currency board is less committal than a dollarization. So it's not the actual dollar used in a currency board, it's just there's a central bank holding some dollars in reserves and then issues its own currency. So it's easier to get out of it currency board uh, compared to dollarization. And Hong Kong has a very famous currency board arrangement. Argentina had one between 1991 and 2002. More weaker than a currency board is a regular peg where there is a peg around a certain band. You can even have some managed or dirty float of exchange rates, or you have a totally floating exchange rate regime. And uh, so we talk today, we will talk primarily about the dollarization, what it implies. And there are two elements to consider. One is if you go from the current situation of Argentina situation to transition into a dollarization, what does it imply? How dangerous it is? What are the sudden stops, the recessions which, which might occur? And then there's a long run effect. What if you have a dollarization in the long run? What are the dangers there? What are the benefits and what are the costs? Of course, on the benefits side, the whole idea is to get inflation under control. You might also lower the risk premium associated with the local currency. So you might get a potentially a lower real interest rate. But of course, if this only holds you have less financial repression, and of course the real interest rate if inflation is very high and people have to hold the local currency, but then always the real interest rate is very low as well. So what are the long run costs? The long run costs, of course, you lose the monetary sovereignty, you lose essentially monetary policy to stimulate the economy if you have a recession or cool it off if the economy is overheating. So you lose this instrument to slow it down or speed up the economy. You also lose the option to devalue your currency in order to stimulate export whenever you need it. So that's one big loss. A second loss in the long run is then if you have dollarized, you lost your seniorage and you also lose the lender of last resort feature of the domain for the domestic banks. So there's no central bank. If there's a run of the domestic bank, there's no central bank having the reserves if you don't have the reserves to really bail out the domestic banking sector, if there's a run on deposits, and if the deposits are also held in US dollars, because the, the, the uh, local banks don't have access to the Fed, discount window, other facilities. So with this, I would like to go to the poll questions, and I'm grateful to all of you for answering these poll questions, just to get us a little bit started. The first question is about the transition from the current circumstances to a dollarized economy, does this lead to a sudden stop? And how severe will be this sudden stop? Um, is it more severe or similar to a currency reform? Is it less severe to a currency reform or is it similar to a regular recession? And the answers were 73% said more severe or similar to a currency reform, less severe 16% and similar to a regular recession is only 11%. 
The other aspects, or the other questions were more about the long run effects. So once you have dollarized, what's it, what are the costs and benefits then? So the main long run costs of dollarizations are uh, the loss of the not being able to conduct monetary policy. That's what 70% thought. You lose the senior rich, that's only about 14% thought, that's a big deal. And the loss of the lender of last resort features for the banks, that's 17%. The third question was about how, much, how costly would it be for banks if there's no loss, lender of last resort feature anymore? So some people say it, it's 30% or yes, yeah, that's, that makes the banks more cautious. Yes, it will make them more cautious, but it's also desirable. There might be too much of risk taking among the banks anyway. That's about 30%. Um, second, the B was it's, you know, yes, it will make the banks more cautious. It's desirable. That's 38%. And there's no effect that's about 32%. So it's roughly equally split between all of the answers. The fourth question was about whether Argentina has too few dollar reserves to really dollarize. And 80% uh, thought, yes, that's a big problem. And 20% uh, thought it's not a big problem. And finally, there's a question whether dollarization would lead to a better integration in the world economy, uh, which meant everything is dollarized anyway. And there the outcome was about 45%, yes, 55% that no. So with this little background and the take of the audience, I pass on the, the mic to Ivan and his co-authors, Thomas and Petro, and we're looking forward to learning more about what's going on in Argentina and how to predict a little bit the future. Thanks, Thank Ivan. you, Marcus. Thank you. Great introduction. And of course, if my co-authors want to jump in anytime, uh, and maybe they'll be the ones taking care of the hard questions at the end. Uh, these guys are wonderful students up and coming. Uh, look out for them in a few years. Um, okay, so let me get right to it. And what I prepared for today, uh, we I mean, we organized this yesterday uh, after seeing what happened Sunday. I've been thinking about this for a little longer. Uh, so I adapted some slides. Uh, so what should you expect from this talk? Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So this is not meant as some kind of political or a bottom line on dollarization um, in Argentina. Uh, it might be useful if you're for it or against it, if you haven't heard these arguments um, or if you're just curious. Um, personally, what I'll have more to add is some new papers that point out some difficulties and challenges and costs but uh you know we're not taking the balance of it all here i have a personal opinion maybe but you know this is going to be an academic seminar where we're going to talk about the things i'm more certain about and i think ideas that we can debate usefully uh so i prepared a crossroads part <laughs> the title uh that is going to be a little more of a background for people that uh, maybe aren't argentine in particular or don't follow argentina a lot you know, basically, how do we get to such an extreme proposal like dollarization in Argentina? Marcus said some things, so I'm going to be re revisiting the things Marcus said, giving you a little more background. Um, and then review the standard pros and cons, also similar to what Marcus said, just uh, um, uh, develop them a little more. And then I'll go to the perils part of the title, which is uh, really these new two papers that we wrote. I think one was issued in May, another in October. Um, and they showed that there's these extra costs in the short run due to a particular situation we think is relevant for Argentina, which is the scarcity of dollars. Uh, there's two kinds of scarcities I'll talk about. So I'll get back to that. These are the papers. Maybe we can provide links to them. You can find them on uh, my the website or, or on my Twitter feed. Okay, so let me start with the crossroads part and give you just a little background. So this is a chart from a great paper by Buera and Nicolini, and they have also a whole, Nicolini and, and Tim Kehoe have this uh, great book on the history of fiscal and monetary policy uh, in Latin America that I recommend. Uh, so on the left chart, you see just why Argentina is so depressed about its economy. You know, it's been in a rut for more than 40 years. Um, and, and, and you see it there in this GDP per capita. You also see it in this ranking of the world, which is maybe a little more of a colorful way of thinking about it. We're not really competing with the world. We just want to do well. But, but you know, we used to be one of the top 15 countries in GDP per capita, and we've fallen uh, way down over time persistently since the 1940s, 50s. 
but we're still happy in Argentina because of uh, these little three things. Uh, that's just uh, to spice it up here. Um, but going back to just to give you a sense of those 40 years real quick, because I think it's relevant to the story. Um, in the 80s, there was a debt crisis. We returned to democracy in Argentina and we lived with very high inflation and high uh, deficits. It repeated failures to control both things. Uh, and finally, kind of a Brady plan that 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 uh, put us back into issuing uh, uh, debt. Um, but we ended that that first government of Alfonsin with uh, uh, starting Menems with uh, two big hyperinflations. That's how things started. I was a kid. Uh, that's what formed me as a macroeconomist. And then we got convertibility. I'm still in high school. Um, convertibility, which is a currency board, as as Marcus said. And that was under Cavallo, which is not uh, uh, Caravello's uh, dad, uh, <laughs> but Cavallo, um, he instituted this uh, currency board, very, very uh, strong reforms, also privatizations, uh, a, a time of great boom and, and optimism at first. Um, but that gave way to, uh, you know, after a lot of uh, tumultuous uh, things in the world, Mexican crisis, Russian crisis, Brazil devaluing emerging markets, the risk premia going up, uh, to you know, debt accumulating, high unemployment, high interest rates, and eventually social unrest in the country, um, and eventually bank runs, and uh, finally convertibility was abandoned, and debt was defaulted on, and uh, you know, people lost a lot of their savings in banks. Okay, um, and so. That's the memory I have of that happening. I was doing my PhD by the time everything exploded. And, and also quasi monies were introduced by provincial governments. Okay. So even before convertibility was abandoned, the biggest province in Buenos Aires issued money, basically. Okay. Uh, here you have something that I think is relevant. Uh, you see uh, inflation. So here you see these, it's in log scales because you can't fit it otherwise with the hyperinflations. Um, and you see here the convertibility really knocking inflation out, okay? Uh, and after abandoning convertibility, we went back to high inflation rates. Uh, they varied and sometimes they were high, but but moderate one digit, uh, but eventually those crept up. Again, this is logs. So, you know, you're getting 30, 35% at, at near the end there. This stops at 2017. I'll show you some more recent stuff in a second. And you see here government uh, deficits, which was high through the eighties, uh, high through, uh, high more recently. This has gone up even now. Um, but what I want to point out is even during convertibility here, uh, you know, we had, we, we had high deficits. Okay. Um, so, so this is a, a picture of kind of the fiscal dominant story of, of inflation, which I agree completely is what is the root of the, the, the problem in Argentina. Um, and, um, that's very different from the fiscal theory price level, by the way. You only need Sergeant Wallace and Kagan for this. Uh, no need for immaculate inflations. You actually see the central banks being called up and told what to do. Um, so I believe in that kind of fiscal dominance. All right. Um, what happened in convertibility? Just a picture of some shocks. You know, Mexican crisis and other issues lead uh, people to be more nervous about emerging markets. The optimism after the Brady plan go goes away. Uh, that raises interest rates. Um, and then Argentina starts having its own path of higher interest rates as people are worried about its debt levels and, and the commitment to paying back. Um, but here you also see another uh, relevant, uh, much discussed issue, which is Brazil devalues. So the real exchange rate uh, uh, for Argentina becomes more appreciated just when maybe we, we were suffering from some other shocks here. And this is soybean prices. So you see that they were like at an all time low, our exports, our main driver of, of exports. And in fact, the years that came later, which, you know, were a recovery period, but also we had a boom in, in, in commodity prices. So, you know, maybe maybe hints of we also got bad luck, but that's that's kind of relevant when you when you think about the cost of uh, dollarizing or pegging or currency boards because you lose this uh, monetary autonomy and you will get shocks. And that's what Marcus was talking about. And these were some big shocks that hit Argentina. Um, in addition to obviously the fact that we never really got uh, the fiscal uh, deficit under control. Um, here you see the sudden stop current account reversal that, that, that occurred. 
Here's one more thing I want to point out because another cost Marcus mentioned is if you uh, dollarize or if you have a currency board, you will not have immediately the same power of lender of last resort. Um, and here you see how people, uh, two things, how people bank dollarize their banking. Um, so the fraction of, of, of deposits that are in pesos dropped as people got more worried about possibly leaving the currency union. Uh, sorry, the, 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 that's a, that's a mistake there, the, the currency board. Um, and also the total deposits, which were on the rise as the economy grew, but uh, you see this bank run at the end here, okay? Um, so that was really dramatic ending to the convertibility plan, okay? So what happened afterwards? And this will be, you know, my last slide showing you kind of bullets about the facts. And, you know, we recovered kind of quick from that in part because the high inflation that resulted uh, liquidated a lot of debt, liquidated a lot of savings for people and um, and for the government's debt. And it also lowered uh, government spending because, you know, salaries and, and other things were not adjusted to inflation. So they, they, you got a, kind of the fiscal balance under control. And then the central bank kind of did its job after a, a big spike in inflation to lower inflation in about a year. Um, but the N Nestor Kirchner then comes around and he's got pretty favorable international prices, but have a policy of a very devalued exchange rate uh, that eventually starts leading, I think, to higher inflation rate. And the fiscal balance it starts eroding. Um, Christina Kirchner comes later as she starts suffering from much higher inflation, um, in fact, fakes the inflation statistics. Um, and, um, and there's a huge increase in spending there, a huge increase in fiscal deficit again. And in fact, a loss of reserves and, and they start using capital controls. So here's a, a quick picture to show you just how dramatic the problem is in Argentina. During that time, especially the, 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 the Christina Kirchner time, this is federal government spending. You see the amazing increase uh, relative to GDP. And this is very hard to bring down. Um, and this is, you know, the, our tax, the, the counterpart of this is our taxes, which are kind of topped up. We have a lot of uh, informal economy. So the, the deficit is, and in, in in the challenge of lowering the deficit is largely a problem of government spending and, and kind of a incapacity to, to get more revenue. But, you know, you see the numbers going from a historical 23% all the way up to 42%. That's just I don't know if we, we're also champions of this in the world. So we're champions of soccer, champions in inflation, champion in increasing government spending. Uh-oh, uh what happens if I do this? Okay, <laughs> there we go. All right. So going back to real quick history, you know, this is very quick. Any Argentine is bored. They know all this. Macri comes in, regains access to credit markets, tightens monetary policy, but doesn't really do much quickly on the deficit side. And eventually, with political uncertainty also maybe looming, uh, loses market access, uh, asks for an IMF program to deal with that liquidity, and it, in fact puts back capital controls and starts adjusting along the IMF program, but but in the economy contracts and loses the election. Okay, so things turn out bad. There's high inflation at the end of that uh, government, and um, and then what we get is Fernandez, Alberto Fernandez, and Cristina Kirchner as vice president. And they uh, undertake a, a, a debt renegotiation at the beginning, uh, but maintain high deficits. Obviously, there's a pandemic, but even after the pandemic, there is a high increase in uh, maintenance of these deficits. And they tighten capital controls to the extent that right now in Argentina, you almost cannot import anything. It's just uh, you know unheard of, and the economy is almost paralyzed. Malay comes in and wins this election. It's astounding what he's done. He's really spoken what he thinks, has it created a huge enthusiasm for markets and for 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 balancing of the budget, which is unheard of. It used to be a bad word in Argentina. So I grew up seeing convertibility, and then everyone ten years later think speaking the devil of Cavallo and anyone who who talked about convertibility. And the unusual thing is, Millet has managed to go on TV, relentlessly speak about it, and actually speak well of convertibility in, 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 in that time period, but also speak importantly about uh, adjusting the government deficit. And he has gotten a, a lot of people's minds, especially the young, changed on that matter. And that's 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 unbelievable, okay? Um, so, and so he's proposing a bunch of things, lowering government spending, uh, balancing the budget, but he's a libertarian. So he also wants to lower taxes a lot. Um, so, before he gained the presidency, he even lowered 
voted to lo lower taxes, which made the deficit worse um, just, just a month or so ago. Um, and one of his big proposals, dollarization, which brings us to today's topic. So just real quick to tell you what's happened since convertibility is we haven't had huge recessions, okay? So the counterpart of we have high inflation is we have avoided big, big crisis, okay? Instead, we have this stagnating economy, of course, which is not pretty either. But, you know, maybe people voted against inflation. Maybe that's in part why Millet won, but it wasn't as big a margin, you know, probably in Germany, if anyone's generating a 50% inflation rate, you know, you kick them out in two weeks. But in Argentina, it still took a runoff and, it, you know, he got 45% of the votes, the current prime minister uh, who, who brought inflation up. So just to show you these kind of numbers, these last few years real quick, uh, starting from 2016. So this is kind of where Macri had started a lower inflation, but it's still pretty high. This is monthly, okay? So I always tell people, you know, in Argentina, we have 15% inflation, it's high. And people say, yeah, that's high. But then I tell them monthly <laughs> and they go, oh, wait, <laughs> of course, compounding, that's 300% or something. So, um, but then you see that after Macri's latter part, inflation took off again, it started coming down again. And then the Fernandez uh, uh, Kirchner uh, presidency just now, you see a steady rise in inflation, but a huge peak here at the end, uh, which is what we're talking about now. What's about the real interest rate? Is because of financial repression, the real interest rate fairly low? Yes, yes. The real interest rate can be very low in Argentina um, for banks and for bondholders in Argentina. Obviously, internationally, you know, people just those bonds are worth very less and there's a high yield with with a lot of risk um people move into real estate they don't have any savings in the savings accounts in the banks or yeah the the the, the deposits and credit is, is at an all-time low i think and 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 for since since tw 2007 i would say where inflation started really picking up that you what you see is people just investing in, in real estate or buying durable goods whenever they can um so everyone has air conditioners LCD screens in, in, in their houses and, and, and those sort of things. Uh, yeah. So um, this just shows you that, you know, after Macri left things with a tiny primary uh, surplus after the IMF program requested, uh, but, you know, obviously the pandemic came and Fernandez and Kirchner came, they shot this up. And after the pandemic, that deficit might've come down, but it's still very high and then on the rise. Okay. Um, so you see, that's kind of the recent situation. Let me skip this. This is important for what I'll talk about later. Reserves in the central bank are really low. In fact, you know, maybe if you go a little earlier, they, they, they were close to uh, 35, 40, and they've been falling, uh, but then they really took a hit. And now certain calculations tell you they're negative. Okay, so these this is showing you negative reserves here. Okay. Because of the IMF lending or what, what, what does negative reserves mean? There's a lot of calculations that go behind it because you have swaps with certain countries mm -hmm. and you have, so you have money, but you have debt on the balance sheet. Uh, so I think this depends how you cut it up. Um, I don't I don't know if Tomas, do you have more details on that? But you can, you can construct different measures. So if the central banks wants to default on some debt, it has some, maybe some positive reserves, okay? But some of those reserves obviously are reserves they're holding for the banks for their uh, deposits, for because there are dollar deposits in, in the banks and so on. So, you know, this is kind of netting out, out a lot of things and you get to a negative number. So definitely nobody nobody ap appeals the fact that we have very low reserves and, uh, you know, depending on how you cut it, you either get tiny, tiny positive or negative. This is just to show you something else on the balance sheet in the central banks that's much talked about in, in this context, which is the central bank in Argentina issues bonds and pays high interest rates on them. Okay, so here you see the stock of those bonds relative to GDP, okay? It's bigger than than their other their other debt which is the money, okay? It's bigger than their base money, okay? Like three times bigger. Okay? So they have this debt and the issue and there it, it's almost like interest on reserve. So it's the count, the, the main counterpart today, this didn't used to be the case, but today is banks, okay? So the banks take deposits and basically just buy these bonds from the central bank to a large extent. Even we cannot see this figure somehow. Oh, wait, you don't see this? No, we see it, okay. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so here are the, 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 the stocks of this relative to GDP, and it's been on the rise. And here's this thing, which is the interest rate they're paying on that, okay? Well, actually this is the, the, the policy interest rate, but it's very related. 
this is the interest rate on these bonds. Think of it. And the main point is, yeah, of course, it's risen a lot because inflation has risen a lot. So as a result, and, and I'm I'm getting these charts from different people who, who produce awesome uh, res, uh, charts with this. Uh, and um, you see here a chart of the, the primary deficits. But in gray, you see something which is astounding. Uh, and I was talking to Greg Ip about this the other day. Because this is the, the 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 interest payments due on these bonds, and that's if you consolidate the government and you think of that, that's part of a second, you know, the the total deficit, not the primary deficit, but the total deficit. And this is the 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 you know it blows your mind if you're not used to accounting and issues under high inflation. Basically, these numbers can blow up a lot. Now, Marcus, you said it in real terms. The real interest rate on these bonds can be very low or, or reasonable. Okay. Uh, they might be even negative during some time periods when inflation accelerates. Okay, but um, but the point is this is still relevant if what you want to do is undertake a big uh, you know disinflation plan because let's say you said no from now on just keep prices fixed right away. Well, for a while you're going to have to pay these bonds and pay this interest. Okay, um, the, the maturity of these bonds is de facto very short, I guess. Because yes, this is pretty. This is pretty. Yeah, this is pretty short. This is pretty short. It's on the short end. I don't have a number for that, but uh, in the months range is my guess. Okay, so um, but the the bottom line is, there's a view that that fuels inflation because even even if the treasury isn't asking them for money, the central bank has to deal with these the, with these bond, you know, things that are due, and it has to roll them over or pay them down somewhat in printing money. Okay. So, so that's who, who owns these bonds. You can can you default on them easily, or <laughs> you're getting into sensitive topics. Yeah, we've done that before. So, and there's talks about doing that or doing that implicitly with very high inflation rates that surprise you or high devaluation rates. But yeah, that's part of the discussion sometimes, or part of the at least in the background. Not, nobody wants to say, but there's a famous history of that in, in Argentina. So it's but it's mostly banks. Yes. Okay, so this brings me to dollarization. What are the benefits? The benefits of dollarization are obvious because you get, it's like a very strong fixed exchange rate that's credible and it lowers it will lower inflation fast in the new currency, okay? Although I'll give you some caveats on that later. Um, it's similar to a credible fixed exchange rate or currency board. But what are the differences and what are the costs? Well, the costs over the long run are that unlike a currency board, you completely lose your seniorage, okay? And this is not totally trivial, although I wouldn't say it's the biggest cost there is, but but it isn't completely trivial in a growing economy, okay? Because it's not just interest rates. If you think Argentina will undertake at some point a catch-up growth process and will issue uh, money in accordance with that growth rate, it's not just the lost interest rate. So it can be it can be it can be non-trivial, um, and 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 in fact, during convertibility, there were efforts to go even further and dollarize that were were sta reached a stalemate because they thought they really needed to get a deal with the U.S. to share the re the seniorage uh, to be able to make the case for this, and uh, that deal was not was not did not prosper. Um, so it's not a small thing. In the past, it's what stopped us. Um, but a big thing. Uh, in my view, is the loss of monetary policy. So I've studied the European crisis, uh, what a currency union can do, uh, create a great recession in, in Greece, um, and uh, Spain, Italy, Portugal, a uh, very long, strong, lasting recession. Um, and, and, and I just showed you what happened under convertibility. Uh, the recession we had, it was, you know, consumption... Uh, fell 20%. I don't think I had that chart there, unfortunately. Oh, no, I don't have that chart. But consumption fell like 20%. Um, these are huge, huge recessions, okay, that we're talking about. Now, sometimes people say, but Ecuador hasn't had one. Okay, but, you know, maybe they come every 20 years. So Ecuador is a sample size of one, okay? These are like the big shock you don't want to have. It doesn't come every three or four years like normal recessions. Those maybe do worse with, with a fixed exchange rate, but they're okay. But the big ones, those those come more infrequently, but they are really damaging. Okay. So you can ask us, if you look yeah. at the shock structure of Argentine, Argentina compared to the US, you know, it, are, are there, is there any correlation between or is it like more soybeans compared to Argentina and US recession shocks? 
the yeah so in argentina a big a big a big source of shocks is the commodity prices because that affects your exports which you're usually pretty borrowing constrained so it, it really makes your current account adjust a lot uh with all the effects that that has and people you know studied so yes uh our commodity cycle i think is more important than than in the us and in other countries that are more diversified uh, and or anyway have more of an internal market uh we depend a lot on that then the other thing was under last two questions yeah. on the short term who owns the banks are the banks well capitalized if a push loss is on them and what's about the pension system how's the pension system organized then okay so let me start Will with go down to the pensions no so the pe yeah the pensions um, we mostly have a pay-as-you-go. There's some investment in, in government bonds that, 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 that can suffer along with any adjustment in bonds. Um, the banks are mostly private banks. There's, um, I don't know exactly where they're... Uh, I think they're they're well-capitalized, but not maybe for anything like this, a, a huge default of this, of this kind. Um, they, their dollar deposits are very well uh, there's no leverage there. There's, you know, this is kind of a very strong macro proof inherited from the convertibility, but that depends on the central bank not defaulting on those dollars they're holding for them, those reserves. So those are some issues. Uh, in the past, we've had huge uh, destruction of of deposits and credit to kind of compensate banks and then maybe bailouts. So we've had to live with during these big crises a big. Uh, you know, there is usually a lot to think about these balance sheets, uh, but it depends on the shock you get. I think going into it now, th they look uh, normal is what I would say. And they're holding dollar reserves with the central bank rather than U.S. treasuries directly, the banks. Yeah. Um, I think they're forced to hold some of these dollar reserves with the central bank and they may have some mm -hmm. other investments, but there's a lot of capital controls as to investing abroad. So I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I think most of it is held with the central bank. So the lender of last resort is a big issue also. And we talked about how that was relevant for convertibility. Okay. Uh, so it's not a theoretical thing. People who propose dollarization in Argentina these days recognize that. And they say, well, we should just let banks become basically offshore banks. Um, I'm not going to talk about the details of that. I don't understand exactly how that works. How do you hope not to have, because, you know, maybe then Panama will not bail out your those banks that lend to you. Um, uh, but there's some ideas there that I'm not going to be getting into today, but it is an, a big issue if you did dollarize. As we saw, if you don't do that with convertibility, you might get a big a big problem. Let me try and portray the argument for dollarization in Argentina, which is uh, interesting. So the idea is like, we've had high inflation. We've had high deficits. Um, we've not been able to deal with this in the last 40 years. Maybe we should give up, Okay and outsource this monetary policy, even at the, all those costs, recognizing those costs, but a little downplaying them, you know, but basically hoping for the best, but we can't tolerate this high inflation anymore. Let's give up on, on fixing it the, the usual way. Um, now, the more sophisticated version of that is a political economy argument that says, look, right now, the government keeps spending, spending, spending whenever it can. And part of the reason is it can just print money to do so. Uh, so let's take away that mo that money printing machine. And this is actually in the words of Millet. He's used that uh, very, very graphically, very uh, persuasively. OK, um, so let's take away that money printing press from politicians because it's politicians fault. They can't control themselves. We need to take this away from them as a commitment device. OK, um, now the assumptions underlying that that I think are important to recognize and maybe question are that does it really buy you commitment? Uh, so first of all, that assumes that if you dollarize, it's either permanent or pretty damn permanent, that it's costly to get out of. Okay, well, some countries have gotten out of dollarization, but even looking at the most recent history in Argentina, convertibility was very, very close to dollarization. For every peso, there was a dollar at the central bank. Um, and people got very used to that. Also, the fact just psychologically that it was one-to-one -one meant, I think, in people's minds, this is the closest we got to dollarization. And people didn't think that the politicians would ever want to destroy that because people found it popular. And yet, we got out of it. Okay, And even before we got out of it, 
people, some provinces found a way to print money uh, to print basically pesos. Okay, so I'm not com completely convinced of the argument that that would that would you know be a, a permanent thing and, and create commitment. A related point is, will it reduce deficits? Well, we also said that during convertibility, there were huge deficits, okay? And allow myself one comparison to Ecuador. Ecuador has had huge deficits and they've kind of raided the central bank's reserves to do that. Um, so the question is, if, if, if that continues and they run out, what, what happens then? So, um, so I think these are the underlying assumptions and, and they're, I want to point out how questionable they are. The other thing is, what about other countries that had a high inflation and are, you know, is Argentina special? I think that's part of the argument. The part of the argument is Uruguay, Chile, Paraguay, Peru. So we're not talking about Germany. They're different than us. We're special. We're worse. Okay. And maybe we are, I don't know, but, uh, but let's, let's, let me put that in a map here for people. Again, you know, this is boring for Argentines. We all know this, but here's inflation in the eighties in Latin America. OK, there's a scale here of how red you are, but everyone's like past the limit. So they're all super red, hot inflation countries. OK, above, I think it's 30, 20, 30 percent. You go red. OK, then in the 90s, some countries started lower inflation. We talked about Argentina's convertibility. Um, and then later in the 90s, other countries joined. Brazil got things under control with the rail plan, Uruguay, Chile. Uh, Chile undertook a very slow disinflation process. Uh, Peru. Um, things are looking good. And then 2010s, they continue to do pretty well. And Argentina got worse and Venezuela got worse. Um, and so this is the this is the heat map, so to speak. Um, what I think is looking at this, it's not completely obvious why, you know, maybe we just lost 20 years. We didn't get on that boat. We slipped off of it. But can we climb onto it? And once you're onto it, it seems people, countries don't fall off of it uh, so easily. So if you do if you get to low inflation the right way without convertibility or dollarization, perhaps you can stay on that uh, virtuous path, okay? That's the argument against it, okay? I gave you kind of a pro con, the argument for it, and I told you why, what, what some of the assumptions that I think can be questioned. Now, let me jump into the ask, more- yes, There's one interesting question by Laszlo Halpern. He's asked, was there no indexation earlier and why was there no indexation in order to fight the inflation this way? Just indexation index of what, in, sorry, of wages? Or, or, of wages, but also debt contracts that you just yeah. get a real interest rate and then, you know, whatever the inflation is, you could pay for it in form of high interest. Yeah, okay, you, you mean so people would tolerate inflation more, yes. So Argentina has been, uh, compared to Brazil and Chile, for instance, always had less indexation. And in part, it was a policy, <coughs> pardon me, in Brazil and Chile to, to adopt indexation, to make things easier. And then indeed in Brazil, they kind of use that as part of the real plan to then lower inflation, uh, these sort of swap currency. But but in Argentina, the convertibility plan actually uh, removed indexation. Okay, so there had been some indexation, there had been some adjustment for inflation kind of laws. And as part of convertibility, because the idea was we're not gonna have inflation and we're gonna allow you to 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 contract in dollars anyway. Uh, so there was this kind of bimonetarism that went along with convertibility, so that indexation was not needed. Okay. Uh, so I think it's the result, reason why there was some lying about the inflation numbers was not because there was some indexation going oh, on. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. The lying about inflation. I don't want to get into all the multiple reasons for it, but um, I think. Um, no, I think I think the main reason wasn't a, a, a direct financial one that might have been part of it, but there was also just political um, cover up, and you know um, there was a GDP index bond where it was much more of an issue of of that being indexed and, and the incentive to to manipulate that. Okay, so let me now talk about the second part, and I don't know how much time I can give myself. I'll try and give you. There's two papers here. There's basically, they're very, very, very simple, okay? They're like a throwback to another time when papers were simple, okay? So one looks like Sergeant Wallace and another looks like a paper by Guillermo Cal in the, in the early 80s, late 70s, okay? And the idea, so the ideas are extremely simple and I can convey them without a lot of technical or math, right? So 
the, what the ideas are is that Argentina is in a particular place also going into this. If it chose to dollarize without first having a huge hyperinflation and defaulting on bonds and, and, and cleaning up the balance sheets of the central bank that way, it isn't a, you know, dollarizing is not so easy because you can't just, we don't have, basically the, the government is broke in many, many ways, in a flow sense, but also in a stock sense, we have a program with the IMF, we don't have dollars, okay? So the state doesn't have dollars, okay? And so uh, there's that kind of scarcity. And there's another question of scarcity of dollars that I'll get to, but um, the question is that that's gonna imply that there's kind of a, a, some extra costs of dollarizing under these conditions, okay? You can dollarize with very few dollars, but it's gonna be extra costly. And this is the new points we're making in these two papers. Okay, I'm just plotting, putting up here the two papers. Uh, you can check them out. There's also some slides I can share about them. Okay, but but so I'm going to preview real quick the, the the main ideas and arguments and results. So there's two kinds of scarcities. Okay, one is a scarcity ex ante. Suppose you announce that we're going to dollarize, but we're going to we're going to dollarize in a year or two. Okay, and that the state does not have a lot of dollars in exchange for the pesos, they have some limited amount, right? And just to put numbers, rough numbers that aren't completely off, let's say this, to, to pay out the whole balance sheet of the central bank today at current prices and get rid of pesos, you would need $40,000 million. Okay, here in the US, you say 40 billion, in Argentina, we say 40,000 million. And, and, um, and what if you don't have that? What if you, remember I showed you negative reserves? <laughs> what if maybe after some effort, to borrow a little with some special deals with some financial uh, uh, risk-taking hedge funds, we get 10,000 million or 15, okay? But we're still short of 40, what happens then, okay? That's the first kind of scarcity. And the second scarcity is suppose we do dollarize with, two, with not too many uh, dollars. And so then people have their dollars, now this doesn't exist. And there's a scarcity of dollars in the population, okay? This one might get, might be less scarce if a lot of people have saved dollars under their mattress, okay? And Argentines are famous for doing that. Uh, I'll get around to that argument. That's true in aggregate, but there's a picture that you have to think about that, you know, the distributional of, of these dollars. So I'm not worried about the top 1%, top 5% of Argentines. They have enough dollars. But I don't know that we know that the median or the, the, or the someone in the 25 percentile won't have a problem uh, with dollars, okay? And that's a different kind of scarcity. One is a state scarcity, the other is a country or person scarcity. And the two arguments I'm gonna make is that uh, during the exanta stage, uh, if you announce a dollarization with a scarce amount of, of dollars, you're gonna get a jump in the exchange rate and a huge jump in inflation in the price level. And over time, as you, as you approach this dollarization, inflation will be potentially even rising over time, okay? And I'll try and explain the logic of this. It's very simple. Um, and if you delay dollarization, it may increase or decrease this inflation rate. Okay, it depends on how scarce your dollars are. For the ex post period, after you dollarize, what happens? We're going to show that if you have too few dollars when you dollarized and people can't make up for it with the dollars under the mattress, then you're going to suffer a sudden stop. Okay, basically, the whole country as a whole will try and accumulate the dollars they're missing. And that's like the country's trying to save. And that can lead you into a recession and lead to a huge real exchange rate depreciation that will effectively mean people will learn less in dollars than they did before. So pe people's real wage is going to fall, right? And as a result, uh, in fact, after the transition, you might get inflation because as this real exchange rate starts recovering, you will see an inflation even in the new dollar currency, okay? All right, so that's the two arguments. So... Um, what, two, le two lessons that come out of this because it's repeatedly made this point that, oh, look, I don't know why it happened, but I'm proposing dollarization and the exchange rate has devalued. That's a good thing for me because it'll be easier now to, to dollarize, okay? And as long as I do it at market rates, I'm giving you a fair deal, okay? This is, this is kind of a logic that you hear a lot. And through the lens of the model, you realize just how baseless and, and ridiculous it is because the market exchange rate is clearly affected by your proposal to dollarize, okay? And there's a feedback loop. And so uh, 
everything I said earlier about what would happen is that you would see when you propose dollarization a huge devaluation. <laughs> but it's not the devaluation that's making the dollarization easier. It's your dollarization. You're forced in, in dollar scarce dollarization that's creating that problem. Okay. So I think it's a, a, a very important to keep that in mind. And the market exchange rate is not like I buy a house from you at the market rate. So I paid what it's worth. Here's like more like, look, I'm going to demolish this neighborhood and let me buy your house. <laughs> it's like, you, you know, you might get a much cheaper price for it now. Okay. Because government policy can affect the prices. Um, and the other point is, you know, people talk about those costs, but they think that at least we'll get low inflation, at least we'll get a very stable economy. And the the, the other lesson of the exposed is not necessarily there's this transition afterwards. Okay. And the other point I want to make is sometimes people say this isn't a problem. Argentine China has a huge amount of dollars under the mattress. And the point we make in the paper is to show that just looking at the aggregate is misleading. Okay. All right. So we write down an heterogeneous agent model and show that you do care about what the median uh, person or uh, et cetera holds. Right. So this paper, the two papers can be seen through these two figures. Okay. The one on the left is a Laffer curve that some people might recognize. Okay. This is revenue obtained from the inflation tax as a function of the inflation rate. Okay. And this dotted line here might be your deficit. So then, you know, there's the good side of the Laffer curve, the bad side of the Laffer curve. And we'll talk about that little figure and, be, and from there we'll be able to derive everything. Okay. And the second paper is uh, more like a, a saddle path uh, of a country saving in international markets. And the point of that is more like a Hume Cavallo, uh, sorry, Hume Calvo, I say, effect, because Calvo wrote this beautiful paper that captures Hume. That if a country starts, imagine we're in the gold standard and a country starts with too little gold, then the country will make an effort to save. And as they save, their consumption will go up. That's what the red line is until they reach the steady state. So that's all this figure is doing. This M is like gold, okay? And the whole point of the second exercise is after we dollarize, it's like we're not going to be at the steady state immediately. We were going to be below, okay? So we're going to have to do that hard work in the Hume mechanism of accumulating those, those dollars. So let me let me start here uh, with this Exanta stage. I realize now I have the non-updated version of my slides, but that's okay. Um, so... Here's the, the model I'm going to set up without too much math. There's a baseline without dollarization where we would be running a fiscal deficit to make it simple. Let's assume it's constant in real terms as a fraction of GDP, uh, but let's imagine no growth. So in real terms, it's constant. Tau bar for all time. That's our baseline. So like if we weren't to, uh, let's be kind to Millet. If, if Millet hadn't been elected, this is what would have happened. Okay? So and that's financed by printing money, seniorage, okay? And just to be simple, we're gonna think always that we were on the good side of the Laffer curve. Most econometric evidence, uh, um, you know, after some interest in the idea that we might be switching to the bad side of the Laffer curve, most uh, economists think that, you know, that we're, we're mostly on the good side of the Laffer curve, that we might just get very high inflation rates because we push inflation very high. All right. so. Now imagine Malay wins and we announced dollarization today, um, and but it'll be implemented in, in some time, maybe 12 months, maybe uh, 18 months, 24 months, okay? And there'll be some dollars D-bar available to do that exchange of pesos uh, to dollar, okay? And we will have this fiscal deficit, but after cap T, we won't have it anymore. So that's why after we dollarize, things will be consistent, okay? Right, so this is kind of the assumption. Now, two questions. One is this fiscal deficit has to be financed from abroad. It's not a fiscal deficit financed from the domestic citizens. Yes, this is a, so right now. This is a closed. Imagine even a closed economy. It wouldn't change if okay. it's an economy. Yeah, this will be financed through inflation tax. Okay. okay. And is there any price stickiness? Is this essential, or is it? No, in this uh, part, there's no price stickiness. This okay. is like a Sergeant Wallace economy. Okay. okay. Right. So, so then. Or a Kagan economy. Okay, so so we have some real money balances that are given by some demand curve that depends on the inflation rate. Okay, and this the condition for seniorage is that the rate of growth of money, which I'm doing things in continuous time, so it's m dot. That's just the change over time in money. 
in the numerator divided by the price level, that should equal your real deficit. So that's how you're financing the government with this extreme fiscal dominance. If you put these two equations together, that implies the following equation that tells you something about which direction real money balances should be moving um, depending on the current inflation rate. Okay, so this is the total seniorage. This is, you know, this would be the inflation tax and this would be the seniorage if I managed to get real money balances to be growing. Okay, so this is kind of standard accounting. Um, at a steady state though, this term is zero and you're just left with the seniorage has to equal the, the inflation tax. And let me call this function here S for seniorage, okay? So I'm just going to plot it over here. So can you really finance three, four, five percent of deficit through senior rich income and alone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and what? And if you do the numbers on that, I was talking about this the other day with Greg. If actually, um, just the back of the envelope tells you, like, say, say you have a deficit of five percent and your money mm -hmm. balances are ten percent of GDP. Then you roughly you need an inflation rate of one hundred percent or more because you need to like you need to like extract of that ten percent of GDP half of it. <laughs> uh, that's kind of a rough calculation because. But people but, will economize on money a lot. What? Holding, they will economize holding money. Yeah, yeah. So right now during convertibility, money balances were more like ten percent of GDP or twelve or you know between eight and twelve, and now they're more like five percent. Okay. Yeah. But it, it's amazing how little it moves with, when inflation rises a lot, at least recently. It's something to look at, though, and to keep an well, eye on. Well, I think it's different when you're surprised, then you can get a lot of yeah. scenery. But no, of course it's different. It's course. But the question is, yeah, exactly. So what I'm going to do in a nutshell is tell you, you know, even in Sergeant Wallace, they talk about these dynamics. They look at these steady states. So these are the steady states, the good one, the bad one. I'm going to be focused on the good one, okay? But they talked briefly about these dynamics that come out of this model if you look outside of a steady state. Um, as you'll see, these dynamics will play a role in what I'm going to do now, okay? Because what I'm going to do is basically here on the next slide, I'm going to assume that at capital T, when we dollarize, we will convert pesos to dollars at some exchange rate, which is like a conversion exchange rate. Call that E, okay? Right? And uh, before that, I'm going to simplify and assume that the exchange rate is going directly to prices, okay? And that's pretty accurate for Argentina. There's huge pass-through, okay? I'm also, though, going to extract, extract from, from capital controls here, right? And from, from the government maybe trying to keep the exchange rate at some level uh, over time. That, I think, is only going to change the timing a little bit because effectively what happens under high inflation is you keep the exchange rate, but then you make it jump. And, you know, so it would change in a micro high frequency level of the story, but I don't think it changes the story overall. And to simplify, think of international prices as fixed and equal to one, normalized to one. Then you get from this condition, okay, and from the idea that this exchange rate has to equal um, the price, that the real money balances at cap T has to equal the amount of dollars that the government's going to put on the table to convert them, which is actually a very natural thing. It's like, if, 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 you know, my money is worth 10,000 million, but you're going to put only 5,000 million on the table, then, okay, by the time I get there, the real money balances are going to be worth 5,000 million. Okay. Because a, a moment before, otherwise there would be a huge incentive to increase prices. So that's an equilibrium condition that we have to add to the model. So we're doing Sergeant Wallace, but be, now we're not doing Sergeant Wallace. Now we're varying it a little bit by saying it's the same model of money demand and so on, but at cap T you're doing this conversion. And what this does, it means I have the same dynamical system Sergeant Wallace had, but I have a boundary condition at capital T. And my boundary condition is this, okay? So in a nutshell, this explains the whole paper, the first paper. What it's saying is, you tell me how many dollars you have. That's the letter D bar here. I'll tell you what inflation has to be at capital T, okay? So if I have very few dollars, I'm gonna have to have a high inflation rate, okay? If I have more dollars at capital T, I'll, I'll start with a maybe you know a high but lower inflation rate, okay? 
So the more do the fewer dollars you have, the more at capital T, the boundary condition moves to the right, okay? But then you also solve the entire dynamics using those arrows I showed you earlier. And the net result of that is you get that already immediately you should have a jump in the price level, okay? Because at the boundary, you need to reach a certain inflation rate, but that means you can't stay at the steady state today. You have to jump somewhere that will lead you to that boundary condition on cap T. Okay, so here's a little picture of that. So imagine at cap T, the amount of dollars I have implies that I have to be, you know, at this inflation rate. Then because the dynamics, as I showed you earlier, are of this form, it must be that at time T, we already jump and the inflation rate already jumps today in anticipation. So that's why this paper is titled Chronicle of, of Inflation Foretold, which is also kind of uh, inspired by Gabriel Garcia Marquez's uh, famous novel, A Latin American Tragedy, like it, this inflation. Okay, so, so then you will get this, this move up. So relative to the steady state, which was bad that you were at, you will have an even worse inflation rate to begin with. And you will have a jump in the price level, which has to, uh, which implies a jump in the exchange rate and a progressive increase in the inflation rate as you approach the date of dollarization, okay? So has that happened in Argentina? It has actually. Every time Millet looked more likely to win, the exchange rate further devalued, okay? Now there may be other reasons, this might not be the only reason, but it's consistent with the story, okay? Um, so the bottom line is we get these results here that I'm gonna summarize in this blue box. That if your dollars are scarce, but not too scarce, then the, the price level has to jump and there will be higher inflation throughout and inflation will be rising as you approach the dollarization date. And also as a comparative static, if you postpone dollarization or if you increase the amount of dollars, you'll get lower inflation today because you're gonna, it's just gonna, for a given D, for example, you need to reach the same inflation rate. But if you give me more time, then I don't have to start here. I can start closer to the steady state. That's the idea, okay? Can I ask a question? So let's suppose instead of dollarization, I do a currency board with perfect commitment. So I cannot yeah. get out of it. I still, with the currency board, I still keep some scenery. Yeah. Or not. How would yes. your analysis change? It, you do keep some scenery here. Uh, that would be, here I drew it so that at zero inflation, you don't have scenery. But if you are a growing economy at zero inflation, you do have some scenery, okay? okay. Uh, so, so that would be, that would be how you think about this figure. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me really quickly mention that there's another case, which is if your dollars are so scarce, you may have to end up at an inflation rate that's on the other side of the, of the of bad laughter curve. So somewhere in this range. Okay. And that implies that you will be on the bad side of the laughter curve, but it's not because of the usual reasons that we might have a bad equilibrium or something. You would be on the bad side of the laffer curve, but in this model, that was a unique equilibrium. So it's kind of different, right? And in fact, in this case, the inflation rate can really blow up now as you keep making dollars more scarce, right? It becomes very nonlinear, intuitively speaking. So let me mention real quick here some, some additional results. Actually, I, I kind of stacked the cards in favor of dollarization because I assumed that the dollarizing policy uh, got rid of deficits after cap T. But suppose I compare apples to apples and say, no, I'm going to I'm going to attain fiscal balance at cap T, but I'm not going to dollarize. OK, then you can do even better because what happens is you already start having lower inflation today. OK, in anticipation of that better fiscal stance that you have in the future. So the comparison becomes even more favorable uh, or more favorable for this dollarization. OK, I've not shown you, but of course, if you have a lot of dollars, then you won't have this problem. So if you have enough dollars to buy the, the real money balances at zero inflation, then you won't have a problem, okay? So I'm talking about the cases that are scarce, which I think are relevant for Argentina. Um, let me just mention one thing too, that this inflation that you get, it's not the, it's not the basic thing. Suppose I'd surprise you and I immediately tell you that we're dollarizing, here's the amount of dollars and I put them on the table. That could produce a loss to me in value of my pesos and in some sense, a, an immediate devaluation. But that would be purely mechanical, okay? That's just because you came up with less dollars than my current pesos are worth in dollars, okay? But what's happening in this model is worse than that because when it's happening in the future, that's happening at cap T. 
But coming earlier, that means you have higher prices and higher inflation. And remember, the government still has to finance this deficit. Okay. And because of that, that exacerbates and there's a feedback loop. Okay. So you, you get a lot more inflation than just the mechanical aspect. Okay. This is a little version of that uh, seniorage curve fit to Argentine uh, money demand. Just to show you, you can get kind of reasonable numbers. A 4% uh, deficit uh, is consistent with 100% inflation rate here. Okay, and the bad side of the Laffer curve in this example, this is more debatable because you have to like now know demand, money demand further away from where we are. Uh, but here, you know, it's, it's, it's above 300%, okay? Um, so yeah, dollarization could take you from here where we presently are at to somewhere further out here. This is showing the nonlinearity as a function of the dollars you have. Okay, if you have a lot, a lot of dollars, then you don't need any devaluation. You don't need any, so you're way out here. If you have fewer dollars, you're gonna have to have, this is how much inflation you accumulate extra because of dollarizing. And here you would accumulate like 100% extra inflation rate. Um, but as you have fewer and fewer dollars, the inflation rate grows, but in a very nonlinear way. That's what I wanted to point out in this figure. You see that it becomes very, very vertical, okay? That has to do with going into this other regime. Okay. I'm going to skip this. Just mention that there's some thoughts here on bimonetarism. Some people say, let's not dollarize. Let's just allow pesos and dollars to coexist more. And you get some similar things because people will shift away from pesos. Uh, so your seniorage problem is still going to get worse. Okay. Um, so now let me shift to what happens ex post, which is another separate paper. Okay, um, and here I, I'd probably be a little brief in the interest of getting to some Q and A's if possible. Uh, does that sound okay, uh, Marcus? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna really give paint uh, the general idea here. So I'm gonna look what happens after cap T and just to simplify, let's imagine cap T was at zero. So I surprised you because I just wanna focus on what happens exposed. So I'm gonna throw away the previous kind of ideas and imagine to, to, to take the extreme case, I surprised you. That allows me to focus on what happens after the, the dollarization. Um, and that means that once we dollarize, money balances are actual dollars, okay? And then the question becomes, do we start with enough of them, okay? And here you have to think that the enough of them means the population. And the population may have enough of them because they already had some dollars and because maybe the conversion rate was good enough that the government gave them enough dollars for their pesos. But if either one is not big enough, then we might have some scarcity of dollars, okay? And that's what I wanna study, okay? Of course, there's also another alternative that you don't have enough, but you can borrow a lot, but that's not relevant for Argentina. We can't borrow a lot, okay? So we wanna think of a case with financial frictions where you can't borrow a lot and you start with too little wealth and you will get a transition towards accumulating more of this money-like asset because it has liquidity services, okay? So the model we write down, and I'll say it in words and not bore you with all the math, is very much like the previous model, but we're gonna also introduce an untradeable sector so we can speak of the real exchange rate, okay? And also so that when we think of nominal rigidities, we can put them there and think about recessions that occur uh, in the domestic economy, all right? So that's the basic You model. have a quick, oh sorry, but very quick, if there's a scarcity of money, do you expect other forms of monies popping up? That's very interesting you asked that. I'm assuming not because I want to think of true dollarization. But suppose okay. what you do is the provinces start issuing money I mentioned earlier. I'm worried okay. about that. Okay. If Even if Argentina as a nation dollarizes, the biggest province in Argentina is, is actually run by a Peronist uh, who, was, who may find himself with very low resources for his budget and just issue currency. So it's a very fiscal country, um, you know, like the US basically, maybe even more. Federal, a federal country. Yeah. <laughs> so um, federal country, yeah, that's the right word, sorry. Fiscal, fiscally bad, federally good, okay. So let me not do this math for you because I think I can do it on a picture. The basic thing you get out of the math is a system of equations that tells you the dynamics. And the dynamics are pictured here anyway. And all they show is that if you if you start not start by thinking of the case without an untradeable sector, which is what Calvo did, then you get this very Hume 
idea that if I'm dollarized, it's the same as being on the gold standard, basically. And I start with too little gold, I'm going to save up. If I start with too much gold, I'm going to I'm going to spend it abroad. And that was really what Hume talked about because he was thinking of Spain that had a lot of gold. And so they were spending it abroad and losing their gold and creating inflation in the world. OK, so that's that's what this part is. And that's what the, and the other part is this one. OK, so. Um, all right. So if I start with a flexible price case, this is what happens behind that. I didn't tell you, but now I'm adding the non-tradable sector. And if you start with too little gold or too little dollars, you will consume less today in, in, in terms of the tradable goods. And you will eventually accumulate dollars thanks to consuming less, importing less go foreign goods. You will then have a trade balance surplus and you will accumulate the dollars. That's what that arrow was showing you. Um, but in the background, now I'm gonna have non-tradable goods and the non-tradable goods, there's no reason for it to contract. OK, because it's a non-traded good. So the natural thing is the non-tradable good stays the same and we just import less. OK, but to achieve that, we need the real exchange rate to devalue. OK, so we need haircuts, OK, uh, to become a lot cheaper in Argentina, OK, in dollars. So people who are barbers in Argentina are going to collect less in real terms, in dollar terms, for their haircuts and for their salaries. OK. And that's what we're showing here, that the immediate implication is a, a sharp devaluation. And over time, barber prices will rise and the real exchange rate will recover. So the bottom line is you will see a suddenly much cheaper Argentina after you dollarize. Um, and this speaks to some people say, well, will I earn the same in dollars? And people are promised that they will. But our model is saying not necessarily, because if there's a scarcity of dollars, you're going to have this real exchange rate devaluation. Okay. And then you, you also imagine that we will never see inflation after we dollars, but that's not the case because the barber prices first drop in dollars, but then once they're once they're being printed out in dollars, they, there starts to be inflation in, in, in their prices. Okay, so this is rising. Okay, uh, so that's what happens if, if prices are flexible. But now you can imagine what, the, what happens if I say, wait, wait a minute, what if those barbers don't want to accept a lower real wage um, or the prices of, of haircuts, et cetera, resist going down, um, then this red line won't be feasible. And instead you'll get something like the dotted line. Okay, All right? The dotted line is actually something else. It's assuming you suddenly fix the exchange rate and you have sticky prices or sticky wages. Then you get something like the dotted line, which is kind of standard. You should devalue immediately, but you can't. So what happens is the exchange rate in real terms start devaluing. Okay, and you get deflation. Actually, in 2000 and 2001, under the currency board, Argentina was in a huge recession and we had deflation and the real exchange rate was slowly depreciating. Okay, all the signs that we needed a different real exchange rate and we were only getting there slowly because of, of nominal rigidities. Okay, so what happens is if you have this inflexibility, quantities are the ones that do the adjustment. So you get a recession. Okay, all right. So the bottom line is with some rigidities, you will get uh, a different path for prices, but you'll also get a, a recession. What we show in the paper is that actually the solution is this black solid line because it's we assume, we allow barbers to immediately adapt and set a new price. But after that, the prices and wages will be sticky. So it's a little different than your typical exercise where you have pesos and the prices are in pesos and you suddenly fix the exchange rate. Because there you know, the peso, still, the peso prices are still kind of sticky, okay? Here we're imagining that you're undertaking a huge reform where people are changing their unit of account. So in that case, then we're allowing you a one-time only free, everyone changes their prices at time zero. And then that would lead you to the black line, which is different than the one I described before, but has the same feature that the price doesn't fall enough and you do get a recession, okay? So... In the interest of time, let me skip this, but in the paper, we provide a calibration that illustrates that these effects can be uh, significant, okay? Uh, calibrate to the Argentine situation. I think we were very conservative there because we, we calibrate it to uh, base money, but if you include this quasi, if you include the other parts of the balance sheet, I think you can multiply our results by three or four, okay? Um, 
And so I'm going to skip all this and, the, and just conclude because I think it's interesting uh, to try and get some questions. My conclusions are, for the crossroads part, is dollarization necessary, given that all our neighbors have done without it? And is it sufficient, given that when we approached something like that in Argentina, we also backed out, like convertibility, or we suffered huge uh, you know, shocks and recessions and bank runs that maybe forced us out, okay? Uh, quasi money has appeared. So is it is it necessary? Is it sufficient? If the real problem is fiscal deficits and we will solve them, do we even need dollarization? Okay. Um, and if the and if we think that dollarization is going to solve fiscal different deficits indirectly, well, think just please remind yourself of convertibility and look at Ecuador today. All right. So and then for the perils part, that there are these extra costs that aren't typically discussed in the literature but we think are relevant for Argentina today, which is there's the scarcity of dollars, two types of scarcity. One that I don't think anyone would argue with, which is that there's a scarcity of dollars in the hands of the government to make the exchange. And a second one, which is perhaps more debatable, do Argentines have enough dollars? I didn't have time to show you this, but I think in aggregate, they probably do. But if you look at, and you think of the 40, you know, we have a 40% poverty rate, uh, and so if you start thinking distributionally, a large fraction of the economy might not have those dollars. And that could be uh, really impactful for them, create a recession or hurt those uh, people in particular. Um, and then these lessons are, let's stop saying, as long as I convert it to free market flexible you know, exchange rate, uh, no problem. And hence any devaluation is helpful because that's missing the whole point. All right, let me, let me, let me stop there. Thanks a lot, uh, Ivan. So I was wondering whether Thomas or people want to chime in, also having seen all the questions coming in. Yeah, why don't you guys pick some questions? I had no time to look at them and say, answer them yourselves or throw them at me. Or Marcus, I don't know if you have picked a question. Well, let, me, uh, let me ask uh, some questions. So one basic question is how Dependent is Argentina with the rest of the world. Now, if I make go for an autarky solution, how dramatic would it be? It's, I guess, it's way more interdependent to the rest of the world than the US is. That's correct. Can you repeat your question about? So the, let's suppose I cut off all the inputs from from the rest of the world to Argentina. Oh, right. How bad is the the current account? Uh, yeah. You know. The sudden stop for Argentina. Well, our history yeah. is that our recessions have always been the large crisis from a huge current account uh, adjustment. So I think, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mainly work through inputs being the thing missing uh, through like a supply side type thing. Mm -hmm. But that too, I think is relevant, especially today, even without the current account because there's a lot of rationing of the dollars for imports yeah. starting to see that problem but also just because consumption will adjust and you know again we had a 20 percent drop in output and consumption so the reason is investment fell by more and imports fell by more than 20 government fell by less than 20 but like this was not a recession of even like in the u.s it was big the great recession because it was nine percent or something but you know consumption less than that output Nine percent, like no, this is like twenty twenty, um, and so those are the kinds of recessions I, I think about. What, what I, explains that the unemployment states were low, relatively low? No, I didn't show you unemployment during the convertibility. Oh, that okay. was huge throughout convertibility, and in the recession, in the the crisis of two thousand one two, it shot up. What I showed you is the only unemployment for the recent years, and that was moderate. And in fact, what I would say is I think we tend to forget. We all have memories, but in Argentina, memories are short because a lot of things happen. So really what we have is a stock of how many memories we can have. But that means we can only remember like eight years in Argentina because like the world moved all the time in those eight years. <laughs> so what I see is people in, 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 in 2000s remembered convertibility and remembered the crisis and remembered the recession. But then in 2010s, we had a lot of other things happening to us and not a lot of recessions actually, um, but high inflation. So now we forget the recession and the crisis parts. And, um, and we just think about lowering inflation. 
that's that's really a, a, a armchair psycho psychologist speaking here, but uh, it's kind of interesting compared to Germany, where <laughs> maybe you know fewer ups and downs um, since the Second World War that you can still remember those big inflations and fear them. Um, but yeah, we I think we could, basically people always remember the last two or three bad things that happened to them, and in Argentina that's just a month or two. <laughs> So anyway, that's but, my you know, but, question but, about but, your but, modeling choices. In a sense that everything is deterministic after the initial shock. Now, yeah, you think uncertainty, risk, and risk premia. So many people say polarization will bring the risk premia down. Is there something? That's a great about? question. That's a great question. I don't think I'm just modeling the case with certainty because it was enough to make the point I mm -hmm. want to make yeah. here. But I agree with you that uncertainty is important. However, I don't think it's so straightforward that dollarization would lower uncertainty. Again, I showed you the risk premium of Argentina under convertibility. It can be huge um, because while you gain predictability on prices, maybe now you have these, these, these sudden stops that are gonna hit you and, and you won't have the monetary policy to deal with them, the, the, the bank runs, et cetera. So you get on the quantity side, a bunch of risks. Um, so, so I, I just be believe it's not obvious which way it plays out in 2015, when Macri, uh, took the government, there was a lot of hope that just by him being more market friendly, um, there would be a huge amount of the counterpart of this, of what you're saying is pre risk premium would go down and there would be a lot of investment, uh, coming from abroad. And that didn't really happen. Uh, in fact, investment was largely driven by government spending, which was one of the reasons Macri uh, in the first two years did not uh, achieve a huge uh, deficit reduction or a sufficient deficit reduction. So, but yeah. Can you test your theories also when Ecuador joined dollarization or Panama? So it would yeah. be, just look at the data. I don't know. I have no clue. How Panama is too old to look at. <laughs> um, I don't know enough about the Panama dollarization. The Ecuador one was done uh, under huge duress and, um, you know, and, and they changed the plans and how they were doing it. It's, it's, these are also pretty messy times. So it's a little hard to, mm -hmm. to look at those uh, events. I would say, you know, it was more of a surprise dollarization coming after in a desperate measure after hyperinflation. Uh, so it looks more like what would have happened, kind of what we did with our hyperinflation. We we adopted convertibility, and they adopted this. Um, so you 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 also get the huge, quote unquote, benefit <laughs> again of those big big inflation rates before they have you dollarized, wiping a lot of people out. So uh, all I'm pointing out is the example part. Be prepared if you want to do that. Maybe you always have to take this bad medicine first. And have a you know huge uh, cleaning up of balance sheets through high inflation, unless you get enough dollars. Um, but yeah, I haven't done those calculations for Ecuador on what are. I'm just drawing off from the German hyperinflation because you mentioned that uh, in 1922 or 23, uh, it was the case that most of the people's savings was wiped out already in, the, in 22, and when the currency reform yeah. happened in 23, there was essentially nothing to be wiped out anymore. But would you say in Argentine, Argentina, there's still a lot of savings to be wiped out or is it pretty much wiped out, people's savings? No, no, there's still a lot of savings to be wiped out. Yeah, that's what I would say. Okay. Um, there has been high inflation, but it hasn't been the kind of upswings of hyperinflation that completely catch people by surprise. So interest rates have to rise when inflation rises and you know that doesn't necessarily mean they've been wiped out. Now, like we talked earlier, they moved away from the banking system to a large extent. They save in dollars in banks or under their um, mat mattress, and they save in real terms in other ways. Uh, savings is low anyway in Argentina. Um, yeah. But how, how big would you say is the informal dollarization? So because there's an informal dollarization going on, and they just make the final step in a sense, to make it formal. Yeah, yeah, that's often used. Yeah, I have no issue with that. That would mean that you have enough dollars, but I don't see that yet. So um, it, it's true that the dollar is used a lot in Argentina for 
fixing ideas of what prices are. So if you're selling your house, uh, you you know either quote it directly in dollars or kind of index it to that, and even payments are made in dollars for those big transactions because of the risk of if I start paying you in pesos for that one week where we're doing the transaction and it gets wiped out. Uh, that happened to me. I worked for a whole month when I was like 15 years old in a video club when those things existed. <laughs> and I was supposed to earn after a whole month, a hundred dollars. That's That was like what I wanted. And I wanted to be able to buy like, I don't know, some video games or something. And then <laughs> there was a huge devaluation. And I, I remember I, I got paid $40. Uh, <laughs> so that was a good lesson, I guess. <laughs> it's a good lesson. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, so where were we? Why did, why did you mention that? Uh, I forget. But yeah, um, it depends on the surprises and such. And they do happen. But um, but yeah, they haven't been uh, of late. There, there's some the questions on, on about which I'm not an expert on that. How would to de how to deal with the central bank's debt relics? If the yeah. ARG dollar rate at some future time is converted to US dollars. Yeah. Well, okay. So that, account. Yeah. that everyone who's proposing dollarization, I think very sensibly is, is, is thinking about that. So they're saying, we're not just going to put the dollars up for the pesos. We're going to put them up for those Lalique too, because I guess they should be on par. I mean, they should be, they're fungible. Why would you treat one liability different than the other? So they, that's where you get to like a, a number like 40,000 million or 30, between 30,000. It depends where the exchange rate last moved um, because you add up the base money with these Lalique, um, which is very close to just adding M2 because like I said, these Lalique are the counterpart of the, of the bank's uh, deposits, uh, you know, in, in the central bank. So, so yeah, the, the the most of the time the idea is that that that's the lie the right measure of the liability, um, which means at least um, there you know there isn't necessarily so basically the idea is people are trying people who think dollarization is feasible they have some plan to get dollars that would cover the sum of the two, that's my impression. Well, may I summarize? your final conclusion perhaps to put some words in your mouth you would say let's get the deficit in order and then think about dollarization i think what that's a good summary and uh, i think that 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 that's also a little bit the plan that i've heard of but there's a lot of uncertainty but i think that's that would be my uh my my summary as well so normally we stop with a positive note during this webinar series and uh, you know there are a lot it's of the World Cup, the World Cup again, or something. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> but Messi is not playing anymore. <laughs> He's playing today. Oh, I see. Oh, in, in my you know, you know, no, for Argentina, Argentina against Brazil, Brazil. it's going to be fantastic. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's also scary. I mean, the Brazilians are very good. So <laughs> let's hope. <laughs> very good. Thanks a lot, uh, Ivan, and thanks a lot, uh, Peter and Thomas, for being with us and answering all the questions as they mm -hmm. came in. And we hope the whole thing will play out well and uh, it will put, will put Argentina to a more stable path going forward. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus. Bye-bye.